Australia, a vast island continent, a bewitching combination of tropical rainforests, arid plains, lush grasslands, and beautiful coastline. Secluded over millions of years, it's evolved its own unique animal species. And if there's one that is the country's unchallenged icon, it's the koala. A cuddly looking bear like marsupial, best known for eucalyptus eating, pouch rearing, and above all, for sleeping. But these tranquil tree huggers have a hidden side. Capable of feats of agility, they're able to make a noise to rival an elephant. And they can move surprisingly fast when it's time to fight. This is the secret life of the koala. North Stradbrook Island in Queensland, Australia. It's a subtropical paradise and home to a wide variety of birds and wildlife. up in a tree a Wendy and her baby Bo. They're among a number of koalas across the east and southeast of Australia which are named and monitored by conservationists who are tracking their often vulnerable populations. Very distantly related to the kangaroo, the koala is a marsupial, meaning that its young are born after a short gestation and then develop in the pouch. Once out of the pouch, a koala baby known as a joey will stay with its mother until it's ready to become independent at around a year. Bo will still take milk from her mother until she's 12 months old, but she's already eating eucalyptus too. Wendy looks like a small bear with her short limbs, chunky body and thick fur. While her nose is particularly large, her eyes are small and forward facing. Koalas don't have good eyesight. Her pupils have vertical slits, which are unusual for marsupials. In the middle of the day, Wendy and Bo are doing what koalas do best, sleeping. tree-dwelling marsupials, koalas spend their whole lives off the ground, eating and sleeping in the eucalyptus, also known as gum trees. Their reputation for always being asleep is not unfounded. Koalas sleep between 18 and 21 hours a day. Activity levels are closely related to their low-energy diet, and that only allows for a few hours awake each day. Koalas are mostly nocturnal, and it's only towards dusk that they will move to start eating. As folivores, koalas are one of the few species that eat only leaves. It means they have a tight energy budget. The leaves of plants contain low concentrations of nutrients. 
so they need to eat a lot of leaves to give them the energy they need. And because the plants are extremely hard to digest, it takes the koalas a long time to get that energy. A koala expends only a third of the energy that a placental mammal would. Only slothsome pandas expend less energy. Eucalyptus leaves are not only low in nutrients, but contain chemical compounds, which make them toxic to most animals. For years it was thought that the koalas were sleeping off the intoxicating effects of the gum leaves they eat, but this isn't true. Koalas have one of the largest digestive tracts of any herbivore, with a six and a half foot long gut, packed with super microorganisms that can detoxify the leaves. But that uses a lot of their precious energy. Their bodies must work hard to ensure their survival on this diet. So koalas have adapted their behaviour to ensure that they use as little energy as possible. Most of the time, they only move very slowly. And the best way of conserving energy is, of course, plenty of rest. Often, when koalas seem to be asleep, they're actually just resting. It's known as rest alert. They can be completely still, but using their strong sense of hearing to remain aware of what's going on around them. Koalas often sleep and feed in the same tree, though they do change trees too. Bo will ride on Wendy's back, clinging on with the same claws that make Wendy well equipped for climbing. Koalas have extremely sharp nails, essential to grip smooth barked gum trees. Their large forepaws have strongly curved talons. Koalas also have a forciput hand with two thumbs. These double thumbs can help them grab small branches. Koalas have rough pads on their palms and soles to help grip. They're the only non-primates to have human-like fingerprints. Despite their reputation as Australia's best-known animals, koala populations are only found in the east and southeast parts of the country. And although they live in a wide range of forests, from arid to temperate to tropical, their populations are often isolated from each other by areas of unsuitable habitat. up on the hills of Monaroe in southern New South Wales, not far from Australia's famous snowy mountains. The climate is cooler and more temperate than Queensland. It's a big day for one young koala. Jimmy is returning to the wild after being rehabilitated. an orphan koala whose life was saved by conservationists. He was found abandoned by his mother at only a few months old and was close to starvation. Now at 18 months, he's gained enough weight to survive on his own. He's had a small tree to practice on, but this is his first chance to put his climbing skills to the test. 
and it'll take time to build up his climbing muscles to full strength. Jimmy's instincts quickly kick in. But there's still a lot to explore. And he's uncertain. He needs to work out whether this is the right tree to be in. need to ensure they obtain as much energy as possible by choosing the best quality food. So they select the trees that they eat from and the leaves that they eat with great care. There are more than 700 varieties of eucalyptus in Australia, but koalas will only eat between 40 and 50 of these, depending on the area, and their preferred trees may be as few as 10. It's not widely understood why a koala will choose one tree over another. Jimmy may choose different leaves to eat at different times of the year, perhaps due to the varying levels of toxicity in the leaves. But if Jimmy doesn't like the tree he's in, that means doing something potentially risky. <laughs> coming down to the ground. Koalas tend not to come down out of the safety of the trees during daylight hours. The minute he's on the forest floor, Jimmy increases his risk of being attacked by a wild dog, a snake or a lizard. Koalas have poor eyesight, and Jimmy's eyes may not be good enough for him to spot a three-foot goanna moving stealthily through the undergrowth. These carnivorous lizards can easily eat a young koala. Jimmy hasn't had a mother to teach him during the important early adolescent months, and he seems unaware of how vulnerable he is. Luckily, he moves out of harm's way just in time. A goanna can climb, but it's not as agile off the ground as a koala, even one who's new to the trees. Once Jimmy has settled on a tree, he starts eating. The amount of leaves a koala needs will depend on its size. A large male can eat up to a pound of leaves a day.
koala feeding always follows the same routine. He grasps a small branch with his forepaw, then carefully sniffs the leaf before eating it, only choosing to eat the very best leaves. Koalas use their highly developed sense of smell to differentiate between types of eucalyptus leaves and their level of toxicity. A koala's digestive process also relies heavily on the mouth and teeth. They will select a leaf at a time and use the incisors at the front of the mouth to position the leaf. Then use powerful molars to shear it into very small pieces. Koalas have a gap between molars and incisors called the diastema, which enables them to push the bulky leaves around their mouths. They can also store leaves in pouches in their cheeks to eat later. Jimmy will also need to establish his home range, the area where he'll find food or mates. Each koala's home range is made up of a number of trees, which the koala will visit regularly. And the size of a home range will be dictated by the number of edible trees. Koalas are solitary animals. They can't afford to expend energy on socialising. So apart from mating season or raising joeys, they will spend most of their lives alone. They share the trees with the common ring-tailed possum. These marsupials like to eat the foliage, flowers and fruit from shrubs, as well as young eucalyptus leaves. But the koala's home ranges will overlap with each other so they can mate. In each area there will be a dominant male who can see off younger males, especially during breeding season. Cape Otway, at the tip of Victoria in South Australia, is made up of temperate rainforest. Its southernmost position on the Australian mainland means that it's cooler and wetter than other parts of the country. There's a high density of koalas here. In one small pocket of land, there are around nine adult koalas per two and a half acres. Many of them are being studied by scientists and wear collars, which collect data on their behaviour. Samson is an older, dominant male. As a koala living in Victoria, he's double the size of males from further north, where the climate is more tropical. Male koalas here often weigh more than 30 pounds. Samson has darker fur and a thicker coat, better suited to the far cooler climes of the southeast of the country. Samson is in a tree where there's clearly nothing to eat, most likely checking for the scent of another male. A koala male is not territorial in the sense of defending space, but in areas where there is a high density of koalas, an older male will show a dominance hierarchy by marking any tree he enters. Each male koala has his own pungent aroma and scent marks with a special gland on his chest. It's a form of communication to advertise his presence to other koalas, both to attract females and to warn off other males. 
he needs to expend valuable energy to continue to assert his claim to breeding. Having checked out the tree, Samson descends. Compared to Jimmy, his descent is far more agile. He's also better equipped to defend himself. He's easily as heavy as a large fox and can fight off smaller animals. But even Samson needs to move swiftly through the ferns. He can shin up the bark with gravity-defying skill. He's got a powerful upper body and his front and hind limbs are nearly equal in length. His thigh muscle joins the shin much lower than in many other mammals, which helps boost his climbing strength. Samson hasn't just got a big body, he's got a big voice too. This noise is known as a bellow, and it's both to call to females and to warn other males of his presence in the area. <coughs> Koalas may be relatively small animals, but their bellow is huge. Unlike any other land mammal, they have an extra pair of vocal folds just outside the larynx, which create this low-pitched sound by inhaling and exhaling continuously. The frequency of these sounds is much lower than those usually made by small mammals. It's actually more characteristic of an animal the size of an elephant. Low frequency sounds also travel further, and a koala's bellow can announce his presence up to half a mile away. It's a way of advertising his size without expending too much energy. The lower the call, the bigger the male. And females prefer larger mates. The high-density koala population in this part of Cape Otway means that the koalas will have smaller home ranges, so there's more competition between males for the same females. Solomon is a large male who will want to mate any females in his home range, and he'll be aggressive to any other male he thinks is encroaching. An intruder is chancing his luck. but Solomon picks up his scent and is coming after him. Fighting males can inflict nasty injuries on each other, which may even result in death. This may be one reason why male koalas have a shorter life expectancy than females. And now the intruding male needs to get away fast. The intruder manages to escape into a tree and hides out there.
keeping out of the way of aggressive older males is important for Jimmy. As a newcomer, he could be vulnerable to attack. He's making his way in the wild now, but is still indecisive about where he wants to be. Koalas are sometimes accused of stupidity, and it's true that in relative terms, koala brains are among the smallest of any marsupial. This may also be an adaptive response to a low energy diet. But Jimmy's repeated change of direction is certainly not preserving energy. It's likely he's still finding the choices in his new environment overwhelming. And it may take him longer to settle. Being near the Snowy Mountains, this is one of the few parts of Australia that sees snow. And when some falls, Jimmy faces another new experience. Perhaps it's his curiosity that brings him down to the ground to explore. coastal areas where most koalas live, they don't have to deal with snow, but they do have to cope with inclement weather. When the wind picks up, they can keep on eating. No trouble clinging on through a gusty night. Up in Queensland, North Stradbrook Island is regularly hit by offshore winds. Wendy holds Bo tight to shield her from a subtropical storm. Both mother and Joey's thick fur protects them. Wind may not trouble them, but if it's raining, the koalas won't feed. To conserve energy and protect themselves from the cold, they remain curled up in a tight ball legs drawn up against their bellies. In southeast Australia, Cape Otway also has frequent and plentiful rainfall. Victoria has a temperate climate, in winter, it rains almost half of the days, and temperatures can get close to freezing point. The koalas here are sitting out the rain too. Victorian koalas have the thickest coats of any marsupial, with a really dense waterproof underfur. This ensures they don't get hypothermia when out weathering a storm.
As the storm passes, the drenched koalas dry their coats off in the sun. Koalas have extra thick fur on their backsides, which acts like a padding against the hard branches. This fur is dappled with white patches, camouflaging them well from would-be predators. The position koalas adopt for sleep also depends on the weather. When it's warm, they extend their limbs to hang either side of the tree. And when it gets really hot, scientists think the koalas hug the trees to control their temperature. Trees are cooled by the roots sucking up water from underground. Koalas don't sweat and almost never drink, so tree hugging may prevent the koala from losing water. But koalas have to cope with far more than the vagaries of the weather. They're so highly specialised to eat particular varieties of eucalyptus in very specific areas that this can cause them problems. Koalas of Cape Otway prefer a species of eucalyptus known as a managum. The number of koalas in an area depends on how much potential food there is. And it would appear that the managums over this vast expanse of land are in plentiful supply. But there are so many koalas here that they're putting too much pressure on their own resources. Koalas have a preference for the younger shoots, which are likely to be less toxic and are easier to digest. And this leads to them over-browsing the trees. Constant eating of the new shoots puts too much pressure on the trees to produce new leaves from their root reserves, rather than through the slower process of photosynthesis. This depletes the tree sugars and the trees die off early thus limiting the koala's food supply. This means that in some parts of Victoria, the koalas are potentially facing starvation. It's thought there are several factors causing such overabundance of koalas at Cape Otway. Their love of managums, their reluctance to eat other trees, and the absence of many predators. But it means that koalas like Samson and Solomon may face being moved to a new territory as part of a government translocation programme. But in other parts of the country, koala numbers are dwindling. And many populations have been affected by the presence of humans. Koalas and their immediate ancestors go as far back as 25 million years. But their numbers have declined sharply in the 228 years that Europeans have been in Australia. The early settlers hunted them almost to extinction for their warm fur. And now the wide-scale clearing of forests 
to make way for human habitation is also having an impact. Koalas thrive in coastal areas where there is a more temperate climate and good quality soil to produce the best trees. But humans love these areas too. As infrastructure increases, what's good news for human economy can be bad news for koalas. In Queensland in North Australia, it's estimated that more than 1.2 million acres of land are cleared every year. Kashi and her joey Polly live in the Moreton Bay area. It's an area with dense subtropical forest, rich with tall eucalyptus trees, where the koalas can climb as high as 100 feet off the ground. Nearby bushland is being cleared to make way for a new railway line. Queensland koalas are classified as vulnerable, so this mother and Joey are among 460 koalas the railway company monitors. The koalas are fitted with radio collars so that they can be tracked using a transmitter. And their movements are logged. It's a way of working out whether their home ranges near to the construction site are being affected. It's likely that a koala maintains the same home range for life, moving between a number of different trees so breaking up home ranges can have a highly disruptive effect. Koala's preference for particular trees means that they can find it hard to establish themselves in a new area. And the more they have to move around, the greater the risk they face, especially from cars. koalas in the project are captured every six months and given a health check. Today it's Kashi and Polly's turn. They're taken to the vet where Kashi is lightly sedated. Polly's allowed to stay sitting on her mum so that she won't be additionally stressed. She hasn't got powerful claws like her mother yet, so there's no need to sedate her. Kashi gets an ultrasound to check her internal organs and a thorough inspection for signs of disease. Chlamydia is an all too common disease affecting koalas, mostly a different strain to the human variant. It can be sexually transmitted or passed from mother to baby. It can cause eye and urinary tract problems and infertility. About a fifth of the koalas here have been successfully treated for chlamydial disease before being returned to the wild. Koalas are also being inoculated as part of a trial to find out whether a vaccine could be successful in the fight against chlamydia. Polly tries to delve into her mother's pouch to feed but isn't getting very far. So there's nothing else she can do but join her mother in sleeping. They get the all clear and Kashi is awake. The veterinary team returns mother and Joey to the same tree where they were found. Kashi wastes no time getting as far away from the trackers as she can. But 
it's not all koalas are so compliant in being captured for a health check. It's ample evidence of how fast a koala can move when he has to. And how well he can jump. But however nimble he is, koalas do sometimes fall from trees, so the researchers can't risk any more extreme moves. And so he manages to avoid his health check for today. able to track the koala's movements on a day-to-day -day basis has given scientists extraordinarily detailed information about them and has revealed just how vulnerable they are. Over a two-year period, almost half the koalas monitored have died. Some of illness, but the majority of predation. Over half of these have been killed by wild dogs. These are not dogs of the backyard pet variety, but rather feral animals, which have often interbred with dingoes and can be powerful hunters. But these aren't the only predators. The dense Queensland bush is full of snakes. The carpet python is between six and 13 feet long and can weigh over 30 pounds. This semi-arboreal snake can easily climb to reach its prey. Its method of killing is suffocation, and it can stretch its jaws to swallow a koala whole. 14 of the Moreton Bay koalas are known to have met this fate, with one python found with the koala's transmitter intact inside its belly. It's the first time anyone has been able to measure predation like this and reveals just how vulnerable the koalas are. But protecting the koalas here as much as possible and continuing to study them ensures their future will be more secure. Whether in the tropics of Queensland the rugged terrain of New South Wales, or the forests of Cape Otway in Victoria. There's no doubt that life as a koala is full of challenges. These highly specialised tree-dwelling marsupials have to contend with predators, human interference, and a difficult diet. But koalas are also resilient and clinging on to survival. And after millions of years of existence, they're still letting their voices be heard.